Part 2. Hood's Attack General Lee's plan was to attack north up Emmitsburg Road. McClaws and Hood's divisions would open the attack and then be joined by Anderson's division. In Part 1, I described the problems General Lee had getting his three divisions into position. Let's look at the main actors in Lee's attack. See this map, which shows the situation around mid-afternoon. Anderson's division is already in position across from Cemetery Ridge, here. Longstreet's two divisions were getting close to their assigned positions. Hood's division is the four brigades highlighted in red. McClaw's division is following Hood's division just to the east. On the Federal side, first there's Third Corps with two divisions. Humphrey's division is here. Burney's division of the Third Corps was forward and facing about southwest. Graham's brigade here, de Trobriand's brigade in the center, and Ward's brigade at Devil's Den. Throughout the day, General Meade would look for reinforcements, and the first place he went was 5th Corps, which was up here. First it was Barnes's division, see it here, with three brigades, and then it was Ayers's division, also three brigades. Let's follow the animation, starting at about 1.30 p.m. Notice the timer at the top. Blue rectangles are northern brigades. Gray rectangles are southern brigades, with Hood's division highlighted in red. See Longstreet's two divisions getting close to their jumping-off point. According to Edmund Coddington in his book, The Gettysburg Campaign, on the way south, moving into position, and near the Peach Orchard, General Longstreet rode up to General McClaws. Remember, McClaws was one of the two division commanders, and the idea at that point was that his division would attack first. Maybe it would have been right about here, where Kershaw's brigade crossed Willoughby Run, and they would have had a view to the east, that Longstreet directed him to attack the enemy there and to turn his flank by using the Emmitsburg Road as a pivot and swinging to the left. It would be a simple operation, according to Longstreet, for nothing much was there. Their intelligence at that time said there were only two regiments of infantry and a single battery of artillery at the Peach Orchard, and maybe that was true earlier, but according to James A. Woods and his book, Gettysburg July 2, at 3 p.m. there were at least three batteries of artillery in the Peach Orchard and another battery with Ward's Brigade at Devil's Den, and you can see the rest of 3rd Corps' infantry was nearby. Also, about this time, there was the meeting of Corps commanders at Meade's headquarters, marked with the red X, that I described in Part 1. After the meeting ended, Meade and Sickles rode south together to look at the 3rd Corps position. And according to Harry Fans in his book, Gettysburg the Second Day, As Meade and his staff rode south with General Sickles, they heard firing in that direction, and Meade sent General Warren off to investigate. Warren rode to the top of Little Round Top and promptly arrived as Meade and Sickles were meeting at the Peach Orchard. Warren's position is marked with a red W, and Meade and Sickles with red M and S. Apparently, Warren found the whole situation at Little Round Top a bit spooky. High ground with only a few Signal Corps flag wavers on top. There was an artillery battery nearby, and Warren asked them to fire around toward the tree line on Seminary Ridge. And this must have been Smith's battery at Devil's Den. Harry Fans gives us General Warren's description of what happened. Apparently, the sound of the shot caused the Southern infantry in the woods to turn to look, and Warren saw the glistening of gun barrels and bayonets, unquote. He could see the Confederate position far outflanked the Union position. He sent a request for troops to occupy the hill, Little Round Top. And the story of the Little Round Top fight continues later in this video. Probably shortly after this, the meeting between Sickles and Meade ended. Sixth Corps. The heavy reinforcements Meade is waiting for was getting close. At this time, they are probably three to four miles away. And see that Barnes's division has started south toward the Union left. They were the first of the 5th Corps reinforcements to be sent south. 
Each of the three divisions in Fifth Corps was eventually sent forward to reinforce the Third Corps position. Barnes's division here was the first. Vincent's brigade was leading the move south. At about this point, McClaws's Confederate division got into position and he got a better look, and he started to have second thoughts. When he arrived, it seems General Kershaw, one of the brigade commanders, walked forward to get a better look at the problem, and as Coddington wrote, to his amazement he saw the peach orchard swarming with federal troops supported by artillery. Their line appeared to extend up and onto a rocky mountain to their left, far beyond the point at which their flank had been supposed to rest, unquote. Kershaw reported to his superior, General McClaws. McClaws took a look and was equally amazed, and he sent word to his boss, the Corps commander, General Longstreet. And Longstreet responded that McClaw's orders were, quoting Coddington, to proceed at once to the assault, unquote. McClaws responded that they were not on the Union flank, and he needed time to prepare for a frontal attack against a superior force in a strong position. But McClaws promised to attack in five minutes. And at some point around here, all the following things happen. Longstreet and Lee decide that Hood will lead the attack rather than McClaws. McClaws is told to wait for Hood to get into position. Hood and one of his brigade commanders each sent out scouts to look at the situation in their front. According to Coddington, Hood was appalled and most unhappy at what the scouts found. Let me use an elevation profile from Google Earth to show you what General Hood and his scouts were looking at. The line here runs from Emmitsburg Road at the Law Brigade start point to the northeast across the summit of Little Round Top to Tawny Town Road. And here's the elevation profile from Google Earth. Artillery batteries were on the crest out in front of Law's Brigade start point. The ground drops slowly all the way to Plum Run, and then up and over Little Round Top and down to Tawny Town Road on the far side of Little Round Top. The vertical exaggeration is set by Google Earth, but it looks to me like they think the steepest slope, which is on Little Round Top, is over 30%. So go find a 30% slope in your town and take a look at it. General Hood tried three times to get his orders changed. Hood urged a move around Big Round Top to the southeast. Longstreet refused. And how long does it take for all this to happen? If we agree that Hood attacked around 4 p.m., what does that tell us about when McClaws and Hood's divisions got into position? My guess is that all this back and forth took at least 30 minutes. So maybe McClaws and Hood got into position a bit earlier than what you see in my animation. And I'm going to zoom in at this point to give you a closer view of the action. Here you see Hood's brigade in position. Law and Robertson's brigades are in the front row, Benning and Anderson's brigades behind them. Law and Robertson's brigades started their attack. Rather than attacking up Emmitsburg Road as planned, they ended up attacking almost straight east. Why? Maybe because they were taking fire from the Slider Farm in Devil's Den and were unwilling to leave Federal troops on their flank or in their rear. About this time, General Hood, the division commander, was wounded southwest of Bushman Farm, and the likely spot is marked by the Red X. He was taken off the field. With Hood gone, General Law was supposed to replace him and take command of the division. The regiments in both of the first two brigades, which is Law and Robertson, became separated, and I've ended up mapping them as four demi-brigades, which is simplifying it, but it's the best I can do. With General Hood gone, and General Law slow to take over, and maybe not as decisive and aggressive as Hood, the Confederate attack became disjointed. Regiments started to make choices on their own. Robertson's left attacked the gap between two of Bernie's brigades, while the other three demi-brigades, six regiments in total, 
ended up attacking Little Round Top. Benning's Brigade, the third of Hood's four brigades, started their attack. Benning was supposed to support Law, but he couldn't tell where Law's regiments had gone. Benning followed the troops in his front, but it turned out those weren't Law's troops, but Robertson's. And when Benning went left rather than right, weight was taken away from the attack on Little Round Top, which is the more important objective. Bradley Godfrey wrote in his book, Brigades of Gettysburg, This was yet another mistake that spelled doom for the Confederates on July 2, unquote. Earlier in this video, I described General Warren sending a request for troops to occupy Little Round Top. An aide galloped off, and the request reached General Sykes, the 5th Corps commander, and Sykes sent off an aide looking for General Barnes, the commander of a division that was at that moment on its way to the Union left flank with Vincent's brigade in the lead. And see Vincent's brigade approaching the wheat field. Harry Fans wrote that they stopped at the Weikert house to wait for instructions. And it was here that General Sykes's aide was intercepted by Colonel Strong Vincent, the brigade commander. Colonel Vincent took the message and without orders, led his brigade to the top of Little Round Top. Colonel Vincent would die from the wound he received on Little Round Top, but his brigade saved the hill for the Union. Benning swept northeast against Devil's Den and the south flank of Ward's brigade. And now Sixth Corps was probably about two miles away. Vincent's brigade took up a position on Little Round Top. General Anderson received a message from General Robertson that he needed support, so Anderson attacked with his brigade. This is the last of Hood's four brigades. And remember previously that Benning was supposed to support Law's brigade, but couldn't find it, ended up finding his own way to the battle. It happened again here. Anderson could not tell where Robertson was, so he did the next best thing and followed the sound of gunfire and Anderson's brigade ended up attacking to the left across Rose Run towards Stony Hill. See Schweitzer and Tilton's brigades on Wheatfield Road. These two, plus Vincent's brigade on Little Round Top, are Barnes's division from 5th Corps, reinforcing the 3rd Corps and the Union left. Tilton and Schweitzer took position on de Trobriand's right on Stony Hill. According to Edwin Coddington, the insertion of these two 5th Corps brigades in the 3rd Corps line created a serious chain of command problem, and we'll hear more about that going forward. Robertson and Law's various regiments attacked the center of Vincent's line. This is the beginning of the Little Round Top fight. If you have a strong interest in this, I apologize. You need to display regiments to show the Little Round Top fight, which this map doesn't do, so I won't say much about the fight for Little Round Top. The overview is it was the four regiments of Vincent's Brigade defending Little Round Top against attacks from six regiments from Law's and Robertson's Brigades. They fought for three hours or more to the verge of mutual exhaustion of both men and ammunition, and the end of the Little Round Top story will come in Part 3. Ward's Brigade defending Devil's Den, retreated. Benning's brigade, plus some of Robertson's regiments, reached the top of Houck's Ridge. Weed's brigade, which is the first brigade from Ayers' division of 5th Corps, was sent forward. Anderson's brigade attacked across Rose Run against Stony Hill. Hood's division was now fully engaged. Part of the division will capture Devil's Den, Part will continue the attack on Little Round Top, and Anderson's brigade has made its first attack on the wheat field. Around 5.30 p.m., Kershaw's brigade from McClaw's division began their attack. And I'll continue in Part 3 with McClaw's attack. <laughs>